Hello, everyone. My name is Staline Volandis. I'm the editor of Town and Country, and I am so excited to welcome you here for what will be a wonderful and inspiring conversation. This is the second in a three-part series hosted by the 92nd Street Y and Town and Country and curated by the Public Theater. It is a series of conversations about the past, present, and future of theater in moments of great change. Today's conversation is titled Present, Culture and Crisis. We're going to talk about how this year has impacted the theater landscape, the theater community, and the communities these theaters serve. The group we have together to talk about it is, is one of those silver linings of this time because it would be very difficult given the panelists' schedules and, um, and creativity, it would be very difficult to get them all together in a room. Um, we have Oscar Eustis, Artistic Director of the Public Theater in New York City, Maria Manuela Goyanes, Artistic Director of Woolly Mammoth Theater Company in Washington, D.C., Nataki Garrett, Artistic Director of the Oregon Shakespeare Festival in Asheville, Oregon, and Professor Anthony Appiah, Cultural Philosopher and Longtime Board Member of the Public Theater. So welcome to our panelists and to everyone watching. Um, hello. Hi, everyone. Hello. Um, I will tell you all, I walked by the Delacorte in Central Park this morning as a way to prepare um, for, for this panel. And there is work happening at the Delacorte um, in anticipation of the opening of the Delacorte this summer. There is a cherry blossom tree in full bloom outside the Delacorte and really throughout the park. And I thought today that Nature is telling us it is spring. I mean, it is telling us that in the loudest voice imaginable. There is a sense of rebirth and of real change happening. And Professor Appiah, I wanted to ask you if given what you hear in your role as the, the ethicist column at the New York Times and, and your role in our culture, are you sensing that culturally and creatively we are feeling the way nature is looking right now? Um, well, I'm certainly feeling that way and I'm, I'm raring to get back into, yeah. into the world of real life <laughs> theater. I mean, you mentioned that this conversation is possible in part because of something of, of the fact that it is on this technology and this technology of course has saved us from complete despair the public theater has been able to do things uh, using online stuff and create new kinds of theater re that reflect the medium uh, i was able to do something that i certainly wouldn't have been able to do normally which is to watch a performance um at the mike uh at the mclally theater in galway uh of a new play once upon a bridge a wonderful new play by by an irish writer uh in which my english based nephew was was acting and uh, I wouldn't have been able to fly to Ireland uh, for an evening to see him do that. So, and, and we've all been taking the opportunities produced by this to, to do things that we wouldn't otherwise have done to bring to bring things. And I think new forms are being created and will survive. They'll, we'll be going on with some of the things that have happened. But I, I think, you know, the absence of um, that regular experience of being together as an audience mm -hmm. is something that I think anybody who has anything, any feeling for the theatre at all has been, we've been having this experience and figuring out how to, so we're all longing to go back. We, we want to know, of course, that it'll be safe. Uh, and um, and that's very hard to, you know, that's very hard to figure out, um, even when, you know, lots of us have been vaccinated. So so there are all those sort of things to worry about, but, the, but there's also, I think, this enormous sense that there's, there's this backlog of being together mm -hmm. and uh, doing things together and, uh, that, that we need to, to make up. So I'm, I'm, I'm ready. It's spring, it's spring in my heart, and I'm, just, <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping that, that we'll be permitted to do more and more uh, as we all get back. Yes. You mentioned the idea of being together in a theater. And of course, 
what happens in live performance is a community is formed. That, that evening, that afternoon, a community happens. We have not been able to create and feel those communities during this time. And there is also, of course, the, the communities of artists and theater makers that as the three artistic directors are on this call that you have led during this time and, and nurtured and, and, and watched go through this time. And I wondered if you each could explain in your individual theaters and communities what this year has been like. Um, Nataki, would you, would you start for us? Sure. Um, you know, and the first weekend in March of 2020, um, <laughs> I opened five shows at once because we're a rotating repertory theater and we were heading towards our 10 show season, which goes for eight months of the year. Um, and then six days later, we shut that season down and we laid off 500 people in the subsequent weeks. Um, so OSF uh, contributes about $120 million a year to the Rogue Valley region. Uh, it's located in Ashland, Oregon, which is a, a tourist town. You can, you know, hiking and um, shopping and, and wineries, and then you can come see, you know, loads of theater and fill your spirit with that. And uh, this was my second year, my second, first, my first full season. So I had just started at OSF the, um, the uh, um, August right before um, and here we are in the middle of a pandemic. Um, so I spent the, this last year really putting in as, as much energy towards saving this 85-year-old institution um, and, and really kind of coming to terms with, with, with why it needed to be saved so that as I was saving it, I was centering what the future of the organization is going to be with this idea of saving it because we're not going back to anything. We can't go back. Normal, normal ended in, in, in March of 2020. And so there's been a lot of focus on rebuilding towards the future of this organization. I like to say that 2020 was the end of the first 85 years and 2021 is the beginning of the next 85 years um, because that sort of helps us focus on how we're going to build, build towards the future. And the last thing I'll say is, a lot of things happened, you know, after we shut down, you know, uh, the, the murder of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor, those murders and the subsequent uprising, social uprising, and the we see white American theater demands. And there were a lot of things that sort of shifted at the same time that gives me a good runway. So I know what I'm supposed to move towards. I have a vision in the horizon that I'm moving towards because, you know, it, it, the, the, it, I felt like society took advantage of, an, of the opportunity of a crisis to really start to refocus its energies. So I have no choice but to refocus ours. Mm. Thank you. Maria, can you share your experience in, in DC right during this year? Yeah, for sure. Although I, I did have a, when you were talking about spring being in bloom, I was like, yes, I know. My sinuses are telling me every single day. <laughs> um, well, and allergies right now are, you know, they're very sort of worrisome because you start, your brain starts to, you know. Go oh, like, oh, I know. <laughs> oh, yes. This is exactly what is happening for me, for sure. Uh, so I am the artistic director of Woolly Mammoth Theater Company in Washington, D.C., it's a 41-year-old theater company. I got here sort of similar to Nataki. I was a year and change in before the pandemic happened. I got two shows into my season and then, well, three shows into my season, and then we had to close. Um, so, yeah. So most of what I've known as an artistic director actually has been, you know, now it's in equal measure, the pandemic. <laughs> um, I should also just be uh, really transparent. I spent a long time at the public theater with Oscar um, and with uh, so many amazing folks there. So whenever you all are talking about the Delacour, it's just, you know, it makes my heart sing. So I, uh, so Wooly, um, I wanted to uh, 
I wanted to go to Woolley because it is one of those theaters whose pillars are actually aesthetic innovation on one hand and civic provocation on the other. And those sort of doors go hand in hand, actually. So there is a part of me, the optimistic part of me, the glass half full part of me that has spent this year sort of thinking about how Woolley has actually been built for a moment like this the kind of nimbleness, adaptability, flexibility of innovation in every aspect of our work, which as an alternative theater company, and by alternative, I mean, in Washington, D.C., the region has some amazing theaters. It's got Arena Stage. It's got the Shakespeare Theater. I mean, there's so many um, amazing cultural offerings, you know, and the Smithsonian, (laughs) let's just say. That ultimately, one of the things that Wooly is here to do is actually be an alternative to that. So if the main, as the mainstream continues to move, you know, say, I, I'm not in competition with the mainstream. If they want to do a show and I want to do it, great, go do it. I'll do something more provocative, more innovative, weirder, whatever. Um, but what I, what I also love about being in Washington, D.C. that I just want to say is it, when I came here, I realized I actually knew the city in a way that I didn't realize because I had come to protest so many different things <laughs> from, you know, uh, going down with the with the cast of hair to talk about marriage equality to actually speaking, you know, I, going back to like high school with the Iraq war. Right. Like I, I being here at the seat of our nation's Uh, democracy, our imperfect democracy, has been really very eye-opening at this moment. And it's uh, it's made my presence sort of showing up to those moments actually feel very meaningful in some way. And it feels really meaningful to work at a theater company that is a cultural creator in a moment like this. So we have been able to actually pivot, do things on the telephone, in addition to Zoom, in addition to, you know, so many different things. Um, yeah, which I can talk about later. So thanks for the question. It's, uh, yeah, it's been a, it's been a big year. Yeah. Oscar, it, it has been a big year in so many ways. Can you share your experience of, of this year and, and leading the public theater in New York in 2020? Um, yeah, I'd be happy to, Celine. And, you know, the public theater, we do new plays and musicals in our six stages downtown. We do Shakespeare in the Park at the Delacorte. And we very we have a mobile unit that goes around to all five boroughs and prisons and halfway houses. And very often we'll develop musicals here that move on to greater success. Most recently, Hamilton is kind of the poster child for that. That was that was our show, is our show. Um, and I have to say that this year has been astonishing for me, particularly being a relatively senior person where I can see the end of my career is a lot closer than the beginning of it. Because this pandemic has forced us into inaction. And like a festival of fools, like a monastic retreat, that in that inaction, we're able to rethink that the things that seemed immutable become pliable again. And I have to say, as we've been talking here, I keep thinking about your book, Anthony, uh, Lies That Bind, which is uh, just one of the brilliant things he's written. But one of the theses of that book is that our identities are rich and very real and very complicated and contradictory and therefore also changeable. Mm. They're not given by nature. And I feel that's what links all of the different uprisings that have happened in this year together, is that we as a culture, and certainly as a theater culture, we've been forced to sit back. And once we sit back, re-examine the desirability of the way we used to do things, the equity of the way we used to do things. So we've been in this weirdly abstract liminal space where in the theater community, certainly, we've been imagining a more just space, a more equitable space, a more humane space. We've been trying to actually implement these practices, and it's fierce in all of our theaters. We are talking about this day and night, and we've been doing it all, and we're realizing that all of this was a dress rehearsal for coming back. Mm -hmm. Now, can we actually come back changed? Can we come back better? Can we come back more just, more democratic, 
more equitable and therefore more relevant, more important to the culture. And that's the test that I feel like is really going to be, we're being challenged to say, come on back. And now, do you have anything to say that makes you matter? And we're going to have to meet that test right away. We're going to have to be trying. And I guess I have spent much of this year in the company of Nataki and Maria and feeling like an old guy who gets to be incredibly hopeful about the future of this field because it has leaders like these. There are people are, are rising up to meet this time who aren't the same people who've been doing it for the last 60, 70 years. And that is where I locate a huge amount of hope, um, which we will start realizing July 6th in the middle of Central Park when Shakespeare in the Park reopens. Yes. Yes, that day, it's like I do my walk in the park and I sort of count down to July 6th. Um, I, you know, we talked in, in each of these answers, the role of theater and its mission and, and really responsibility to the community sort of was in each of these answers. And Professor Appy, I wondered if you could talk a bit about how you see theater's role in the community, how it's understood by the community and perhaps how it's shifted this year. Look, we're all used to dead theatre because we all go to the movies. Uh, so we are already used to, we, we're, we're already used to, and I, I love movies. And, I, and one of the pleasures of this year has been being able every evening with my husband to watch a new one. But, yeah, yeah. Um, but, but the whole f the experience of not having the live theatre mm -hmm. has just over and over again reinforced in my mind two thoughts one is we do live in a great age of television and movies uh, and, and and that's connected i think with the strength of our live theater um we, we wouldn't have the the the, the creative um juices flowing that we do if we if it wasn't uh uh some of it wasn't flowing out of 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 the live theater i think that's a really important thing and and i think we can see that in the way uh, in, in the sort of creativity that live theatre people have put into going on being available to us uh, when they when when the government rightly has closed the theatres, um, so so I think that's that's one one thing that I feel very very strongly is that this year has has sort of taught us that that we need that. But what's it what's it for? Well, another thing it's taught us is that um, is a very important point about the arts, which is there's no given answer to the question what they can do. Um, the, the, you tell an artist that there's something that art does and the next work she produces will be something that doesn't do that because the idea of being constrained by somebody's idea about what art is is just the thing that I think, you know, irritates the heck out of creative people. So we can't say in advance everything that art can do, but we can say what we've been missing uh, which is a certain, I mean, that experience of thinking about the political life of your society in a room full of citizens <laughs> is different from reading a, a book of political philosophy or watching a television program about the presidency or something, all of which are important uh, things to be doing. Um, and I think that, that um, you know, the, the, the uprisings are obviously in part uh, re reflect the need to connect that people felt because we'd all been pulled off uh, if we were lucky enough to be able to to be pu pulled off, I mean, into safe places, but safe places meant unsociable places, places where we were uh, in, in, the, in the deepest sense in our private lives, which are an important place, but, but we can't live just in private. So I think one of the things, the energies that generated the, the, uh, of, of these movements was the sense we, we've got to get back, to, we've got to be together. And mm -hmm. the best of these uprisings were responsible about it. They, they masked up, they kept their distance from one another, but they couldn't remain silent about the wrongs that they were responding to. Now, one of the things that we would have had in response to the catalogue of horrors that people were responding to one of the things we would have had if we'd still if we'd had open theaters would have been a different uh set of possible responses a different set of ways of thinking about it which the theater would have which the live theater uh would have produced and again um i i missed that sense that i i could have um 
that, that I could have gone with other citizens whom I didn't necessarily know, but be citizens together thinking about these things in live in a live space together. So that's one of the things that I think we need to, um, we'll see what happens. As I say, you can't tell artists what art does. They'll, they'll, they'll do things with it. Uh, they'll do new things and they won't, I, I think it's completely right to say uh, that, that we won't go back. I mean, the live theater is always changed by big experiences. Um, the Vietnam War changed American theater. Uh, the Iraq War changed American theater. The, uh, the gay rights movement changed American theater. And this experience of, I mean, there are many sort of morally important features of what's just happened to us. Um, but we, we haven't talked about the other big thing that happened, of course, which, was, which is that the, the pandemic sharpened many of the social divisions in our society very, very profoundly. And because of the pandemic and because of the different political responses of different parts of the political spectrum to the responsibilities imposed on us by the pandemic, responsibilities of, uh, of doing our, each of us our small part to make sure the pandemic didn't, the, the disease didn't spread uh, uh, as, as dangerously as it, as it could have. Um, because there were different responses to that. That's another thing we need. We need to get back together in the hope that we can uh, talk across those divides. One thing that happens when you're pulled into private life is I'm pulled into a house with another Democrat. <laughs> and, and other people are being pulled into houses with other Republicans. Now, I know there are mixed uh, party houses, and that's one of the interesting things that I, people ask me questions about in The Ethicist, is how to live with the fact that you can love someone who has terrible politics from your point of view. But... Um, but I think we need to get back together for that reason as well. Yeah. Um, the, the, the divisions in our society. Um, and what, one of the good things about what's happened in our theatre, in, in, the, in the public theatre, is um, because we've, we've, we've come together and responded to the challenges, to, to the, the old ways we were doing, uh, not doing things about, uh, about race, race in our society, and, and to, I think also class. Um, because we come together about that, we, we are better equipped coming out of this yeah. to do some of that work. No, uh, and I wondered, you know, the, the three artistic directors on the call, New York, DC, Oregon, I wondered if this time has, has how it's impacted how you communicate or your sense of how you serve your individual communities, where your theaters are. N Nataki? Yeah, so Celine, OSF is the is one of the largest economic drivers in the region of Southern Oregon. So when I say, you know, if, if by by New York numbers, 120 million uh, contributed is is kind of tiny, but in this area, 120 million is is you know, I laid off 500 people, you know, 20,000 people's lives were also um, affected by that. Um, because of, of, of how big we are. Uh, we also had a, a terrible fire uh, at, the, at the end of last summer. I think it was the day after Labor Day, uh, in which 2,400 dwellings were burned to the ground. And almost the entirety of the working class neighborhoods and towns that serve the two larger cities, Ashland and, and Medford, largest 20,000 people. Um, so, and we actually, our response was we opened up our theaters. It became a service center for, for people in, in real need. We are still housing some of the fire victims and some of our company housing. Um, and that response is, is going to be ongoing until, you know, people have other options. And we were already were an area that didn't have a lot of housing. Um, so our, our, uh, our impact in the region is um, no matter what we do, if we sneeze, this area feels it. Um, and at the beginning of this, I don't know if this town really understood the weight that, that the organization was under. So we had a lot of conversations with people about simple things like, you know, why don't you just get the actors to stand on a stage and say some words? And we had to say, <laughs> no, actually, that's not how it works. And we're dealing with their unions. And these are professionals. This is their job. And this is their livelihood. Um, and so while we do understand that, you know, your restaurant stands um, um, to, 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 to really have a real emergency fiscally, we're, we're talking about a global emergency. And, um, and if our little universe here was a globe, it, it, the impact is the same. It's reflective of, of what's happening across the, uh, the world. 
Um, I think the other thing is how we're going to respond as we come back. So we've been in meetings with the business owners and, you know, we're talking to the restaurants about like the date that we have to open and do they have enough people to serve, you know, and, and do we have enough places for people to stay when we do finally open? And um, uh, so that part is actually pretty easy. I think the hard part is the consistency because we're a destination theater. Mm-hmm. Oregon Shakespeare F- Festival um, is, is a place where you have to determine before you come, that you that you're going to take a trip there, and you're going to rent housing and 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 be here for a while, um, and so that means you have to choose to come from one of the major cities. We are the third largest theater in the in the Bay Area. We are the second largest theater in both um, uh, Portland and Seattle. So people have to make that decision, and a lot of my my conversations here locally have been about whether or not people are going to choose and who are those people that are going to choose to get into their cars to come to see theater here. And I'm trying to take advantage um, in these next, these next few months of uh, what for this town is relatively new and, and, um, and odd, which is people traveled to Ashland last year not to come see theater. They traveled to get away from their major cities. And for, for, uh, for Ashland, that is not something that happens. People come for the theater. So to have it all, all of a sudden you have people coming and renting their, their Airbnbs and staying in these places with their families, because as, as Dr. Appia says, they can pod in, in these spaces and feel comfortable and get away from these other areas. What we're trying to do is figure out, we're trying to figure out how we're going to take advantage of that group of people. Um, because I believe that we're moving from at OSF um, the predominance of the retired dollar, which is who we mostly relied on for our ticket sales. I, I think that we're now moving into a space where we're going to have more working dollars, where people are going to be choosing to move through where we are, and we're going to try to get them to come and see the work that we do. And the response of that is to make sure that the work on our stages reflect what they need in their lives. Um, after being shuttered for so long, after being, you know, some, some people are moving in with other families and out of doors. And, you know, how, wh- who, who are we to those people who come here for respite? Yeah. Um, because that's not vacation anymore. That's something else. Yeah. Um, it, it's interesting also listening. In a way, this year has made communities realize how interconnected everything is. And, and Maria, I wondered if in, in DC, the, you know, the idea of the restaurants, like you open and the restaurants have to be ready to open. And I'm not sure if before this, we all realized the, the impact theater has, first of all, on the economy. I mean, forget our well-being. I think certainly everyone listening and certainly this group knew that, but the impact it has on the economy and the domino effect that the closing of the theaters and that they've remained closed has. And and that impacts community in a way I'm not sure we realized the depth of that before. Maria, how has that experience been for you in DC? I mean, what I what I love about what you're saying, Staline, is that this is and this is actually speaking to what the coalition is attempting to do, right, is really actually sort of lift this narrative up that that we're not actually siloed and separated from each other, that actually our communities What I'm working towards in Washington, D.C. is interdependence, that my success, that the success of Woolly Mammoth is interconnected with the success of the community organizations, with the restaurants, with all of the, you know, the things that make my community my community. And how do we how do we actually um, help each other in that way? And for me, you know, I, I spoke a little bit before about how I'm sort of not in competition with other theaters. I think this is to me, part of the the question, right, is that actually coming from a place of interdependence doesn't breed competition for that dollar, right? It is assuming, and and I just want to be, what my experience is, is the rich got richer during this time. Mm-hmm. I just want, you know, my the disparities that uh, Professor Appia was talking about, really, I mean, they were on both sides. 
And so to me, the, the fact that like, somebody is giving money to the theater at Woolly Mammoth, there is no reason why they can't give money also to the homeless mm-hmm. shelter down the street. And there is no skin off my back to make sure that folks know that actually are, we're all connected because this is helping our community in, in real ways. So I, um, I've been thinking about that a lot. And I've been thinking, I, I actually um, wanted to say something around the preaching, the preaching to the choir thing um, and, and sort of talking across difference because there's a couple of things that come to mind. The first is, you know, Woolly Mammoth is equidistant from the, <laughs> from the White House and the Capitol, literally equidistant. Um, when I got to Woolly, everybody was like, you're just preaching to the choir. It's such a progressive city, you know? And what I have realized over this time is our choir is divided. We are not speaking the same language around representation and identity and the supremacy, right? We're not, we haven't been speaking the same language. And so I, I actually think that this is the part where I am really interested in continuing to um, bring nuance and depth to these conversations, right? And to be able to speak from my lived experience as a first generation Latinx woman from Jamaica, Queens, rather than as a monolith of, of whoever it is somebody wants to put me in. And how do we, how do, we do that also for our industries as well, right? The theater industry has sort of, it's like compartmentalized, separated from the, you know, other nonprofits from the restaurant industry. And we're, we, all can actually, we all can actually work together. Um, it's also funny to me, lastly, to say that we're having such a hard time with conflict in this country because conflict is our bread and butter. <laughs> Just want to say. And so there is something to be said about actually theaters and, and um, being at the center of a lot of those conversations around how we make meaning of difference and how we move through that. It's not just the empathy argument. I believe in the empathy argument of like seeing other people's stories, absolutely. But it is also about how we talk to each other and what conversations we are sparked from seeing a piece of art or seeing theater, or seeing something happen on stage. And that to me is the other thing that I feel like we can, that's a way forward, I guess, is what I wanna share um, that I'm putting a lot of hope in. <laughs> No, it, it, it is the way forward. Um, you you mentioned briefly the the coalition and the the three of you are also we're talking a lot about community, right? The the theater community, the community at large, and you are also creating a kind of community of nonprofit theaters. So I, I wondered, Oscar, if you could sort of begin to to talk to us about the coalition of nonprofit theaters and and the vision behind it. Uh, well, I'm happy to chime in, but really I think Nataki should start this because okay. what I've basically done is salute Nataki and it's worked out really, really well. <laughs> Nataki. <laughs> uh, thank you, Oscar. So um, that's interesting. I, um, I read an article um, in the New York Times last summer uh, that said, uh, Oscar Hustis, Maria Goyanis, Joe Hodge, um, uh, Audrey McDonald, Lynn Manuel Miranda, and um, uh, uh, Ruben Scott Ruben Scott, Scott Rudin should all go to Capitol Hill and start to fight for some uh, some resources for the American theater. Um, in the and it was just after Britain decided they were going to give their their arts organizations a, 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 a nice tranche of money. Um, now we know that Britain has a practice of that, and so we don't. So the next day, I called Maria and was like, "When do you want to get started?" Um, and that came out of the the, the fact that uh, OSF worked with Portland Center Stage, the Symphony, and the Opera, um, and the Ballet, all in in Oregon. Um, and we we fought for CARES Act funding. We we were able to receive about eight million dollars. Um, OSF received 4.7 million of that uh, because we're the largest um, arts organization in, in the state. Um, and the way that we fought for it was by saying, there are these small little tranches of money across the, 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 the state. Um, if we start to go for that, then we will take it away from all the smaller organizations. 
Um, and so we organized, we, we hired a lobbyist and, 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 the, and the sort of rest of that is, is uh, history. So when I called Maria um, and she said we should speak to Oscar and, you know, we started to call the people on that list to see if we could build something. We were still asking whether or not this was something that we could do or should do, build a coalition around advocating for, um, for uh, nonprofit American theaters. Um, and, and so we, we put together a, a group. Um, uh, uh, we asked um, our friend at the Ford Foundation, Darren Walker, to help us convene a group of people. And, um, and those people showed up and, and we began a conversation and a series of conversations with people who are experts in this area around how we might begin to rescue ourselves as an industry. And my, my um, impetus was that you know, we were, I'm an, I'm, I run a, a, a huge theater, uh, one of the, the top three budgeted uh, nonprofit theaters in the United States. We actually have a responsibility to make sure that the smaller theaters and the industry as a whole can rise. Mm -hmm. And so we are the ones that actually we have to be at the center of that conversation. Um, and that's been the primary driving force. How do we make sure that culturally specific theaters, um, accessibility specific theaters, um, uh, uh, community rural theaters, how do we make sure that those theaters um, um, have a chance? The only way we can do that is to advocate for resources. And um, what we learned along the way, I think was something extremely important and um, inspiring, which is, uh, first of all, we can collaborate um, and, and build coalition around things that are really important to us that we believe in. And the second thing is that we are also interdependent that we have to do it that way, that we cannot, the, the silos of the past are, 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 are not the, the uh, interdependent uh, collaborative space of the future of the American theater. If we are to survive, it is together. Um, and, and why are we going to survive is the third thing. The third thing is the most important, we're surviving to make sure that we have a space for those artists to tell those stories. To, to be impactful in the way that they are. And if people didn't learn anything else from this, this time, they learned that how important artistry and art is as they were you know, on Netflix or you know, wherever they were trying to sort of consume as much story as possible to reflect how, who we are right now and how we're gonna get through this. And so I, I believe that the, the primary focus of this coalition is to make sure that our theaters can become spaces for the art and the artists and, and that we can survive and, and, and continue to do the work that um, the public good work that we, that we said that we intended to do 50, 60 years ago. Um, so that's the sort of introduction to the, that work. Oh, it's so exciting. You talked about the interdependence and I just wanna take a few minutes to talk about that a little bit more because I think that that is, is, is a new way of looking at the, the community, the theater community. So I'd love for, for someone to sort of talk a little bit more about how the coalition sees that. Um, this is, I mean, Maria just gave a really eloquent speech about interdependence. And I have to say, don't you understand why I feel optimistic about the future? Yeah, of the yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. And my next question, because I know everyone watching is asking is, is what we can all do now. So we're gonna get to that in a second, but uh, because I know that's all I, I just, whatever I can do to make this all happen, that's all I wanna do now. Um. <laughs> well, I think the, you know, the, the, the basic point that Nataki and Maria have both made is that the theater is stronger when we are seen as an integral part of a society as a whole. And that means we have to be about bringing people together. Um, Anthony, you were talking about, you know, how going into a theater with your fellow citizens and having deep issues debated. Well, those fellow citizens don't have to agree with you to walk into the theater. And what spaces do we have anymore where people who really disagree with each other can come together and not just see the same play, because audiences don't just see a play, audiences become a community. And, and you know, when you contrast the experience with Netflix, which I will now always call dead theater, Anthony, that's a beautiful <laughs> way to put it, is that, you know, laughing is better when you're surrounded by hundreds of other people laughing. Crying is more moving when you're hearing sniffles all around you. And silence is more silent when it's somehow the theater has cured everybody's cough 
because no matter how much somebody feels like coughing, their body won't cough at the moment that they're waiting to see what happens next on stage. And that, you know, President Obama once said, the only thing that he and Dick Cheney had in common is they both loved Hamilton. And that sense that we can actually humanize each other by sharing that space together. We, we're the anti-internet in that way. We're the anti-siloing. And that just, it, it, it's an incredibly important and, and uh, occasionally daunting challenge. But now we have to go out and demonstrate how we fit into the fabric of society as a whole, how necessary we are to the whole society. And if we can do that, that changes the argument for what theater is doing in the world and why it should be supported. It makes it a much bigger argument than when we started, even though we said a lot of things at the start, in a way, the nonprofit theater, the basic idea was us, we should have a nonprofit theater. Well, yeah, but why? And that's our job now is to really define that why in this time of crisis. Um, you know, I, I do think that everyone watching um, will understand the why and the, the necessary of, of what we're talking about and what you are all doing. And I do think that there is a, a question out in the world of how we can help now. Right. We've been I, I think everyone that that loves theater is has tried to support it in, in different ways. But listening to, to all of you and and the work that you're doing, I do feel because I'm feeling it. I do feel that the audience would love to know how to help now. And I wondered if you each could just offer offer some advice to them. One thing I'll say really specifically is donate to the theater that's in your community. Donate to the theater you love. Support arts programs for kids, which are immensely effective in bringing in kids who have different learning styles into a real educational curriculum. And boy, do the kids need it right now. Also, support Woolly Mammoth in Washington, D.C. Support the Oregon Shakespeare Festival in Ashton, Oregon, because these are exemplary organizations with exemplary leaders. And probably most of all, just keep looking for the ways that you can lift up the theater, demand more from the theater, participate more in the theater, and tell our elected officials that the theater is central to your experience. Yes, and, and what are we all looking forward to? This is called The Way Forward. So what are we all looking forward to this summer? Um, I'd love to share any any. Any news from, from the theaters or, or Dr. Appiah, what are you excited about first? You know, this conversation has reminded me of, a, of a, something that happened in my own life, which is when my, my father was a political prisoner uh, two or three times in Ghana. And uh, the first time uh, he asked if he could have Shakespeare, uh, the, the Greek works of Shakespeare given to him. And the director of the prison said, no, he's a well-known British subversive. And um, my and my father went to the prison doctor and said, would you mind writing me a prescription for Shakespeare? Because I think that's the only way I'm going to get it. So my, my father got Shakespeare on the prescription. But the thing that I, the thing that that, that story reminds me is, um, it's a wonderful fact about the United States that some of the most um, challenging, exciting democratic theater is done in the name at the Delacorte and in the Oregon Shakespeare uh, Festival of of a dead white male who is loved, beloved around the world, beloved, as you now know, in prisons in Ghana too. So I think um, we've known for a very long time, <laughs> people have known for a very long time, that theatre can both challenge and delight. I mean, those are the things that theatre does. And, that's, and the fact that we can continue to be challenged and delighted by, by this long ago guy um, is I think, you know, just it's one of the things, it's one of the first things I'd tell the Martians if they wanted to know what we humans were like. I'd say, this is one of the things we do. This is one of the things we care about. And in communities all around the world, people are performing for one another in, 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 different, in different ways with, with and without music and, and with and without religious meaning and so on. Um, so what am I looking forward to? Well, I want to go back to Shakespeare in the Park. <laughs> uh, because it's, it, it, I, I remember 
as a child going with my aunt and uncle in England to, to Stratford, uh, which we did um, every summer. We went to see something. Um, I remember seeing uh, Judy Dench in mm -hmm. Love's Labour's Lost, I think. Um, anyway, uh, so this has been a part of our life as a family uh, and, um, and so many lives as family, I, both Shakespeare and, and the theatre more widely. And uh, so I, I really want to, I, I'm, I've missed, I've missed, uh, so, you know, I've missed my yeah. Shakespeare. And well, Maria, what, what, what should we be excited about? Well, so I had to jump in because uh -huh. even though we don't do Shakespeare, I am, you know, in four hours, I've taken three COVID tests. Uh, so have all of the actors and other people in the space. And I'm about to go see a, the first run through of Where We Belong by Indigenous theater maker Madeline Syed, whose show specifically, Professor Appia, is about her going to go get her PhD in Shakespeare in England and then quitting it because it was really difficult to deal with the fact that um, the UK hasn't dealt with its colonial past and present. And she and she she has so many fascinating experiences around that. So I felt like I had to jump in because even though yeah. we mostly do new plays, Shakespeare is still at the, at the heart of this one that I'm, I'm doing with the kind of indigenous lens around how Shakespeare was forced, um, uh, you know, talk about uh, language. Um, being lost in terms of the indigenous folks in this country and how Shakespeare actually was meant to replace that in a lot of those schools. So um, I'm really excited about basically going to the theater and yeah. being at rehearsal. And, yeah. Um, and Maria, is there programming this summer or in the next few months that, that you'd yeah. like to share? This show actually will come out in June. It's a film of, of this show. It'll be out the middle of June and it's actually in association with the Folger Shakespeare Library, which is here in DC, uh, as well as uh, it will be part of the International Festival of Arts and Ideas in New Haven, Connecticut. So folks should check that out. It's called Where We Belong This Summer. Great. And Nataki, what about the Oregon Shakespeare Festival? What, what should we be looking out for? Um, from, from, from your company? So um, on our digital stage, we have ongoing uh, this project that we're calling Shows on O. We have a number of beautifully recorded uh, plays that, um, that my predecessor actually spent a lot of energy making sure that, um, that our archived plays were very well preserved, you know, several multi-camera setups and all that stuff. Um, so right now you can go to Shows on O and see um, uh, Manahatta and, Sh and Snow in Midsummer. Um, we just had Ju uh, Julius Caesar, uh, Shanna Cooper's um, direction of Julius Caesar. And then live, we are, we're hoping to do a little bit of something this summer, but we have it. We're in, in a conversation with the governor right now, trying to figure out what are the criteria for opening and how do we open? Um, Oregon doesn't really have that organized yet. So we don't know actually how we're going to do that. And then in the fall, we're, we're hoping to be able to open, um, uh, August Wilson's How I Learned What I Learned, uh, which will be directed by Tim Bond. Um, and then Mona Mansour's Unseen, directed by Evren Achikin, who is my um, associate artistic director. And then we, we're, we're pretty sure that we're going to have something um, around the end of the year holidays, uh, a piece called It's Christmas Carol by Mark Bedard, Britt Hinckley, and John Tufts. Um, so we, we are very hopeful for some sort of opening. I'm a kind of an optimistic pessimist. So um, what I've asked my team to do is prepare for us to open and not open at the same time and prepare to open and have everything closed within 24 hours, because that is my lived experience here, yeah. um, that you, you can actually move towards the possibility of opening and know, know that things are going to close. Lastly, we do have two, uh, we have a film that's being done right now by the same um, filmmaker who did the, the film Ashland. Um, the, she's back here working on another film called You Go Girl. The director is Sharifa Ali, and she directed Copper Children, um, which is a, a, by Karen Zacharias, a play that we opened last year and closed within the first five days. So there are quite a few projects, both online and offline, that we're doing. Um, and, and I look forward to, to that. And then to your, your question about how you can support the theater... So there are several people, so we lowered our tickets, you know, and our membership and all of that stuff, all those packages have come down. And my hope is that the people who really do love OSF 
will buy a ticket for themselves and for somebody who can't afford it. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll buy another ticket, even if that those people can't come. We'll figure out a way to help people get here if they can't get here. And we'll, we'll also support the work that we're doing online and support our sister theaters in the Bay Area, in Seattle, and in Portland. That the region actually has to survive for OSFs to survive. So come see our work, but see everybody else's work too. And like Oscar said, support all of the theaters on this call and, and the theater around the corner from your house. Yeah. Yeah. No, this sort of the, as, as we sort of were so constricted, the expansion of, of how we view everything really is, is, has come out so much in this call. And, and Oscar, you know, our last um, panel like this, you had not announced yet the, the opening of the Delacorte. We sort of teased it, but it, it was sort of to come out in the paper a few days after. So, so why don't you tell us what we have to look forward to officially now at the Delacorte this summer? Well, on July 6th, Sahim Ali's production of Merry Wives of Windsor is going to begin delighting New York. It's Shakespeare's most purely lighthearted play. Mythologically, uh, Queen Elizabeth said to him, I would like to see Falstaff in love after she saw Henry IV. And uh, therefore, it was commissioned by a queen. It is a delightful comedy that basically skewers male vanity, pretension, sexual predatory nature, and sexual insecurity. The women run this place. And Sahim, my brilliant uh, associate artistic director, is setting it in contemporary New York in southern Harlem among the African diasporic community. So it, the cast will be entirely uh, Africans and African-Americans it is joyous, it is celebratory, it is making that statement that is so important that Shakespeare belongs to everybody and that the immigrants are central to America now as they always have been. And I think it's, uh, you know, I think the, frankly, the first performance there, I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to get out of my seat afterwards. I am so eager to laugh and cheer and just be in community with my city again. Yeah, no, the, that, the, those first performances are around the country at, at all your, your theaters are going to be um, just, the, uh, just this outpouring of, of everything. Um, you know, we titled this series, The Way Forward. And, you know, like the spring that we first talked about in this call, and you sort of see the cherry blossom trees and begin to see a way forward out of this, that's how I feel after hearing you all speak. I really feel I, I, that I can see the way forward and more importantly, I can feel it. So thank you all so much for all that you do um, and, and for all the art that you bring to the world and the thought and the emotion and, and for joining us today. This was, um, it was just beautiful, really beautiful. So. So thank you, and I'll be in D.C. and in Oregon as soon as I can. I can't wait. Um, and I hope you all will continue to join us in this three-part series. Um, the next is about the future, and it will be an all-artist panel uh, sharing their dreams and their hopes and their plans for the future of theater. So thank you for joining us today, and we hope to see you again on May 20th. Um, and thank you all, really. Thank you. Thank you, Staline. Thank, thank you. you so much, Staline. Thank you for having us, Staline. Thank Deline. you. Thank you. More soon, I hope, from everyone. Thank you. <laughs>